Welcome to Season 3 of Travel Stories with Marsh. So if you love the world around you and you love exploring different landscapes, cultures, cuisines and cities, then you are in the right place because here every week I'll be talking to an incredible travel enthusiast who will take us around the world by sharing their travel stories. On the episode today, I am joined by Arathana Koala, who is a leading voice in the travel and tourism industry and in the luxury hospitality sector. Arathana is also a fierce advocate of regenerative tourism, and she joins us today to share her incredible travel stories. Welcome to the podcast, Aradhana. You're finally here. We've been talking for months. So thank you so much for Excited joining us. Excited to be us. here, Mosh. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. So, you know, you are uh, somebody who travels a lot. You travel extensively. You travel around the world. But at the same time, you're also someone who is very passionate about regenerative tourism. Now, I find that very contradicting. How do you balance your carbon footprints with a cause that you feel so passionately about? It's the duality of life, right? But listen, I hear you. It all starts with a certain le level of awareness mm -hmm. and making conscious choices. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to put my hand up that I am extremely conscious. I um, travel 200 days in a year um, and I'm probably, you know, one of those who fall in the category of being a frequent traveler or a super amateur, mm. which is only one to three percent of the overall population. Interesting. But we are responsible for close to 50 percent of all carbon emissions. Mm. So I um, I know the, the burden of that responsibility on mm. my shoulder and I do what I can. Mm. You know, I'm on the climate friendly register. I try and offset before I fly. I try and choose flights which have lesser carbon emissions mm. compared to those which are more. Mm. Uh, I try and fly direct. <laughs> um, I try and travel light. Mm. You try and choose sustainable accommodation but you have to be also I think humble and say listen what I do is not enough by any stretch of imagination mm. and I'm cognizant of mm. that mm. but like I said every given opportunity I use my voice I use the platform that I have mm. to spread further awareness about the need to make this green transition but that's very interesting and like you said you do as much as you can you know and the fact that you try and do as much as you can at the same time you also promote something that you feel very passionately about and that is important like you don't stop doing what you're doing just because you know because a lot of people out there will say well you're talking about responsible travel then don't travel at all yes. you know I mean <laughs> But then there is there is a fine line that you have to draw in all of this. Now, you also said that you travel 200 days a year. Now, to begin the very first question of the podcast, <laughs> I want to know out of those 200 days, which is the country that you will be taking us on a journey today? I love Georgia and I could go on endlessly about how beautiful the sceneries are or uh, you know how good the food is. So uh, are you taking us to Georgia today? That Georgia, exactly. Okay, okay. And I'll tell you why. Um, if you travel in, in Russia or any most of Central Asia, mm. the best restaurants in all of these places tend to be Georgian. Okay. The most spectacular food, uh, kebabs, kachipuri, uh, kinkalis, which is their dumplings, absolutely fascinating. But there's something which very few people know of, how exceptional the wine is from mm. Georgia. Mm. So Georgia is the cradle of winemaking. Mm. I mean, we're used to um, grapes, which mm. wild grapes right mm, mm. but cultivated wine mm. cultivated grapes for wine mm. can actually be traced back to the sixth century um and it was found in georgia mm -hmm. the funniest part here is that i'm sure you will enjoy this it's the only country in the world when you arrive at immigration the immigration officer handles you a bottle of wine saying really? welcome to Georgia. I think it's fascinating. So tell me, apart from the wine and apart from, you've been there a few times now, what is it so, what is it that is so very unique about Georgia, which you absolutely love? You're taking us on this journey, so we want to go to Georgia with you. So it has a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, um, the, the, the highlands, um, so the most 
scenic mountain ranges you have uh, batumi which is the coastal side mm-hmm. um, you have tbilisi which is a proper uh, capital city with the freedom square tons of history culture medieval villages a little bit of everything mm. um but what would stand out for me most and it's also the position that georgia is in mm. right but for me uh, the food and the wine stand out most okay that's excellent <laughs> food and the wine stand out for you in georgia and if mm. anybody wants to go to georgia you would highly recommend that they do not miss the food and the wine oh, scene over there absolutely eat <laughs> oh that's fantastic Now I want to bring um you know one of you I want to talk about one of these uh, expeditions that you did yes. um in a remote part of India in Ladakh. You know tell us a little bit more about that because that is a place that not very many people go to but again is gaining a lot of you know momentum as far as tourism is concerned. Mm. So talk to us about Ladakh because you know I think it's interesting for listeners to know people who are especially not Indians to know what Ladakh really is about. Right. So Ladakh is perhaps like a secret treasure. Mm. It's one of those privileges uh, mm. a traveler's life affords to be there. Um I'm fairly widely traveled but there are very few places in the world where you get to and kind of a gasp escapes your lips and you're like mm. Wow. I mean, in all my years of traveling, I've never seen something which is more pristine, more surreal, um and I guess unusually undeveloped, which makes it otherworldly and it's kind of magical. So I started this social expedition thing we we did our first one last year where I trekked up um the Himalayas and as you know, Ladakh is part of Tibet 25% of which is with India 75% with China um uh, it's a hard place to get to mm. so last year we trekked up um 4500 meters above the sea level and it's an arduous trek with solar panels on our back to bring electricity to this monastery which is close to 1000 years old and it's never had electricity. Oh wow. It's only survived on kerosene lamps. Mm. Now when we trekked up there, we had to use our mobile phone flashlights to see what was on the walls. All four walls of the monastery is covered with the most sensational paintings, religious scriptures, relics. But it's not it's shrouded in darkness. No one can see it. Oh. So you bring solar electricity there. and this year we went back again uh, again social expedition and we bought um solar powered heating at two schools again these are hard to reach areas they're so remote that's really incredible i think it's really special to have the privilege to be able, able to give to something back, yes. something back but what is apart from you know the abundance of natural beauty yeah. around uh, the entire ladakh i mean it is incredibly beautiful that we know yeah you know but what is the attraction apart from you know a social expedition trip that you did so it's one of those places where you if you're lucky enough to know enduring love it stays with you long after you have left that's beautifully yeah. said now you know let's uh, i know you you travel a lot as we all know but let's talk about a, a place that you think is highly underrated which is a destination according to you is is a very underrated destination and that really open your mind to that destination. So I don't know if I if I would use the word underrated mm. but uh, you're right in that it's not in the global conversation mm-hmm. it's not marketed widely mm-hmm. um sure. you yeah. know but what comes to mind is earlier this year we were in Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Fantastic. So part of the original yeah. silk yeah. route yeah. and it was absolutely fascinating. It's so steeped in deep history it's like you're in a life class are these all all these places so all of the stans yeah. there are yeah. seven of them part of the original silk route mm. we did three this time i still have the others to cover mm. but it's fascinating so starting with um kazakhstan right mm. um you have outside of almaty there are these deserts that sing 
mm-hmm. quite literally. So the sand dunes are quite tall, like 100 meters tall, and they stretch for kilometers. You could hike up, you could slide down, you could uh, hear the singing because when the wind blows or sweeps through the sand, it's pretty much like an organ playing. Oh my god, it's that's fascinating. fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. That's Kazakhstan for you. And then you have Kyrgyzstan, which is um how do I put it? The original true wilderness nomadic experience. Mm-hmm. So you you stay in yurts, mm. which is an engineering marvel if you ask me because the temperatures can go to minus 40. It's really cold. It's extremely windy. You're pretty much exposed to the forces from all four sides. Mm-hmm. So when you see these yurts, you're like there is no way this is not going to fly away. But they keep you warm. They don't fly away. <laughs> oh. And it's absolutely fascinating in terms of how they use the natural materials like goat hair and camel and all of these leathers which is from the area and hence 100% regenerative to really build these yurts which are as sturdy as you could potentially imagine or dream. Fantastic. And then you do in Kyrgyzstan um something which i adored which is um, eagle hunting. So you have it's a very traditional mm-hmm. uh, practice where you have falconers and these majestic birds of prey golden eagles they are trained to listen to the tap of the master and down they come sweeping acting you know and catching their prey and running away it's just flying away not running away yeah. but fascinating wow. there is something which is the world nomad f- olympics mm-hmm. so like olympics for nomadic sports mm-hmm. like um goat polo mm-hmm. or where you're uh, or horse uh, wrestling on horses right, right. so imagine riding horses so this is in kyrgyzstan. kyrgyzstan they they take turns so this mm-hmm. year we didn't we, we 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 couldn't be there but i have mm-hmm. to go back uh, it was in astana which is in kazakhstan mm-hmm. this year but they change every year there are 100 countries com- competing mm-hmm. so it's proper but imagine riding a horse it used to be historically with a goat carcass as the thing that you oh. throw in uh, but it's not anymore yeah, i mean i yeah, guess blood and go yeah, yeah. but fascinating things that you only can find there yeah. which then brings me to the last bit which was the heart of the the, the silk route uzbekistan mm-hmm. mosh it's just the most spectacular beautiful place that you can imagine the Registan Square mm. which is in Samarkand imagine turquoise tiled madrasas all four sides wow the most beautiful square in the world that you can imagine it is just stunning it's the grandeur and uh, you know the 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 charm mm. of the original silk route mm-hmm. the, the the trading empire right mm. and of course i have to talk about food because i'm ultimately <laughs> all must. about food i think yeah, i travel for food yeah. <laughs> um plov which is not you know pulav yeah. equivalent the plov p l o v you find it in all of the stans but uzbekistan takes it to a completely different level because there are 26 different types of plovs oh from wow. 26 different regions and so many different ways of making the same thing and all equally delicious it's insane it's um oh, that's it's fantastic a <laughs> i love the way you've described all of these three you know uh, Kazakhstan Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan and who knew that there were so many types of plovs as you call it in Uzbekistan i mean reason to travel like i travel for food so definitely and also the you know the different things that you said in doesn't it also go on to say like how marketing goes to you know promote places like you know these places have been on the back side for a long time it's only now that people are discovering you know yes. going going to these places um you know discovering all the beauty that it has there so it's so important uh, because also these places need the tourism oh yes absolutely you know I they mean, need yeah. the tourism that's again responsible travel that's also regenerative travel because you're supporting an economy uh, an economy and the people living there right so i think This was fascinating. I loved how you described all three of them. <laughs> Now, you know, let's talk about I know you loved uh these three destinations yes. and you do love going off the beaten track, but let's talk about your favorite destination, which <laughs> is that one destination that you absolutely adore and love and would keep going back to. Oh, well, you know, this is going to be tricky and a hard one because I've lived in five continents. I've lived most of my life abroad, but I am um, <laughs> uh, I was born in India. It's my origin and mm. it's such an integral part of everything that I 
am, mm. my identity mm. and everything. Mm. So it has to be India, I think, which has to be my favorite pick. I mean, you have Kashmir up north. You have uh, God's own country, the tranquil backwaters of Kerala down south. You have Rajasthan on the west, which is stunning. Mm. And then you have the bustling streets of Calcutta with the most amazing street food yeah, uh, anywhere yeah. that you can find. Yeah. So it, just the diversity mm. and the layered nature of each of these places. Mm. It is just mind blowing what yeah. you can do in India. So love being back. No, no, you're absolutely right. And being Indian myself, I mean, every, I mean, being Indian myself, I haven't been to every part of India because yes. it's hard, right? I mean, and there is so much left to explore. But now let's talk about travel bloopers. You know, mm. when we travel, <laughs> things happen. And, uh, and I don't want this to be, it doesn't necessarily have to be negative, right? Because sometimes, you know, you, you go to a place, uh, things happen, but you just learn something new. So what is a travel blooper <laughs> in your travel life? So every new year, we generally try to do something which is um, which is fun or, um, you know, mm. yeah, mm. Uh, which ticks my need for speed. Sure. So this year was um, uh, January 1st was skydiving and bungee jumping in Queenstown, which is the venture capital of the world in New Zealand. Mm. Bungee jumping. Now, I've done bungee jumping tens of times before. Mm -hmm. I should <laughs> I should have done better. Mm. But it was an absolute disaster. No. Absolute. And I know theoretically having done bungee jumps before, but I'm standing at the edge of the platform. And then I go completely blind oh. and blank. And stress and anxiety takes over and I'm not breathing. So I'm really holding my breath. And instead of diving, <laughs> I go leg first. Oh. <laughs> at that, like the whiplash, if you're going at that accelerated speed, means you rebound and you're thrown around like oh, a that puppet can be in dangerous, air. dangerous, right? You can actually put a lot of pressure yeah. on your neck. Uh, it's not pleasant. And when you do that, your instinct kicks in. You're not thinking straight. So what I did, like a really idiotic person, is try and grab hold of the rope, oh. which gave me rope burn, which was the worst thing to happen. So it couldn't have gone any worse. Um, yeah, I mean, it was... Um, uh, so that was a proper a blooper. Proper blooper. <laughs> it was a proper <laughs> blooper. But I'm sure you learned so much with that, right? So you would be careful. Like, even... Like with adventure sports, this is what it is. Even if you've done it so many times, I mean, consider every time to be your first time, exactly right? Exactly right. You know, that's that's something that you have in your bag now that, you know, you've learned something. <laughs> so, okay, that's an exciting blooper, but it could have it gone was, wrong in so gone many terribly ways. Terribly wrong, yes, exactly. It's not very pleasant. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> but, what you know, having traveled so much, you know, you've been, you've been to some really strange places if I may say so you've been to places which are out of the ordinary you've been to places which are you know off the beaten track etc and you've been to some really you know, known famous destinations yeah. as well and like we've said in the beginning you travel 200 days a year out of all of this do you have a hidden gem that you would like to give us today give it away to us today or okay great um, so I love Africa mm -hmm. and within Africa uh, one of my favorite places is uh, Rwanda now, obviously, Rwanda mm. is fan fantastic and great mm. for, uh, you know, the scenery. And if you have to watch mountain gorillas in the wild, mm. you have to go to Rwanda, Uganda or Burundi, one of those places. But Rwanda is the main place yeah. where they have um, uh, the mountain gorillas. Um, but I don't mention Rwanda from that perspective. Mm -hmm. We forget that... Rwanda suffered what is perhaps one of the darkest chapters in human history. history yeah. The genocide is only 30 years old. So in the Genocide Museum, you're hearing people talk about losing their parents, losing their children, losing their brothers, sisters, families, friends, mm. losing everything. But imagine coming out of the museum and going to a restaurant and the person sitting next to you is the person who was on the video in the museum. Oh. Or the person who, the barista in the coffee shop, mm. was the young girl who was talking about losing her parents in the same genocide. So it is so fresh mm. and so part of the daily lives. And then when you take into account that this is a country that has risen pretty much from the ashes to 
do what they are doing now mm. it is just hugely inspirational mm. right um yeah it is it's inspirational it's in so many yeah. ways yeah so are you calling rwanda a hidden gem yes in terms of um in terms of what can make or break it for you in mm. terms of a place which is truly transformative mm. so where you walk in and walk out yeah, and you're a different person yeah. so it's yeah. because you know for, when when people talk about rwanda like you rightly said they will talk about the gorillas yes they will talk about everything else in terms of the greenery and you know what a what a great place rwanda is in terms of um there is a lot of unity amongst yes, the people who live yes. there all of that but nobody has said uh, talked about rwanda from the angle that you're talking about you know that there is there's so much to actually just just their their history and what they've lived with can teach you and can be so transformational so in that so sense true. you so can consider it and it's what you said mosh before right mm-hmm. Travel is all about storytelling I'm mm. a marketer at mm. heart mm. at the end of the day you create stories with mm. travel but also travel creates stories yeah. and it works both ways yeah. which is yeah. um yeah it's no, no, uh, absolutely uh so Rwanda as a hidden gem that's that's I mean it's it's nicely put so I like <laughs> like the fact that you talked about Rwanda now let's talk a little bit about uh, responsible travel which we mm. touched a little bit upon now what are the little things I mean you're someone who feels very passionately about this so what are the little things you do for responsible travel I know you do a lot but yeah. let's talk about the smaller things that you do which can have bigger impacts right so it's i think a bit of it what we covered which is i'm on the climate friendly register mm. uh, i um track my carbon footprint yeah in, in terms of choosing sustainable accommodation or really ensuring that your intervention is not at a superficial level yeah. but when you're in Rwanda you're doing things which yeah. is a lot more than just see the gorillas so do something meaningful you know exactly in, right. in your own exactly way you know right. it just it has exactly. to make an impact it can be something very small but do it you know with all your heart yeah Yeah yes. that's the yes. most important thing. Now yes. staying well on you know staying on regenerative tourism and because you know you really know the subject so much more than a lot of us out there. So which countries do you think in the world today are leading the way in regenerative tourism and they're doing something about it? I mean give us a few names. Sure. I always give the example of Costa Rica because it's the origin of um, uh, one of the countries that pioneered regenerative tourism mm-hmm. not just from a perspective of uh, let's preserve and conserve the nature 25% of their entire land is conserved and things like that but what fascinates me most about Costa Rica is how deeply entrenched this as a principle is in the DNA of the people. Oh that's very you interesting. You speak to a 4-year-old child, an 8-year-old child, they will talk about regenerative tourism and looking after the environment in a way that you would never hear in most other parts mm-hmm. of the world. So they it's part of life for them, which I think is fantastic. It is. Um I love um New Zealand in terms of what they're trying to do with really upholding the Maori culture. Mm. So there is the Tiaki promise which is quite central to New Zealand tourism where you are kind of pledging to look after your land and people mm. which i think is the right way of operating yeah. like i said it's not just the environment it is the people yeah. and people are central to everything i um would um i love the galapagos islands also also because of the wildlife mm. and everything around it's it's so unique mm. unless you preserve unless you really have draconian laws mm. you can't protect that place because mm. it's so fragile mm. right i mean it's such a unique ecosystem yeah. it's like no place on earth the, the animals and plants they don't look like anywhere else that you find mm. anywhere else in mm. the world so you have to protect it 92% or 97% of the arch- uh, of the archipelago is um, it's um, demarcated as a national park Fabulous. so you can't just venture in and walk into yeah. the beaches yeah. you have to be with someone and thank god for that because yeah. Yeah. the last thing you want is tourists being responsible there yeah. right in yeah. in a place like that so they do a fantastic job i think um in the region saudi arabia is pioneering regenerative tourism which i think is fantastic mm, fabulous this is saudi arabia saudi arabia oh fabulous no these are great examples and i don't know if you have been but another country i would like to add is bhutan i love bhutan yes yeah, i think bhutan is doing great i mean they they really 
look I mean they don't allow a lot of tourists that's right in, there's in, a cap in, yeah yes. there is a cap which is fantastic yes and uh, just the way they do things it's so brilliant and I didn't know about Costa Rica so that's a great example I think all of these countries are leading the way and it's good to know because I don't think all of us know about which are the countries that are really doing things which are effective and meaningful enough for regenerative tourism. No, absolutely. You know, and it's so important. Yes, 100%. It's so important, you know, if, if the economies don't lead it, then, you know, people will travel anyway. So Correct. So let's do something about it. You know, that is, I think, a very important point that I wanted to bring forth through through this podcast, just talking. I mean, travel stories is amazing, but these yes. are also travel stories. Yes, exactly. You know? And exactly. talking in your own little way. You yes. Know, in your own little way, do something. So that's my little bit. Uh, <laughs> Uh, doing a little bit for uh, for the world at large. Now let's talk about uh, places that you think uh, or you would highly recommend for people to visit in 2024. Listen, um, if you're in Asia or mm. in Central Asia, I would say go to the Stans. Um, so uh, explore All the three the countries that you mentioned, for sure. Route, yeah. Yes, yeah. because it's uh, really undiscovered and it's really every you know every it's worth the effort mm -hmm. to get up there and mm -hmm. uh, uh so we're check talking about there. Uzbekistan Kazakhstan Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan go to exactly. these and, you, and then yeah. you also have Tajikistan Turkmenistan and yeah. uh, Mongolia yeah. but uh start so somewhere definitely worth exploring the yeah yes. sure if you are in Europe one of the places that really took me by surprise is um Andorra Mm. Now, Andorra is a very small country with a small population of 70,000. The most amazing, charming, friendly people that you can find anywhere in the world. 90% of Andorra is either mountain ranges, fresh meadows, lakes. So it's nature, nature everywhere. 10% is uh, marked out as World Heritage Sites. Uh, so it's really special from that perspective. But it's also excellent skiing destination but if you're an outdoor enthusiast hiking rock climbing skiing mm. any of those things interspersed with culture and architecture which is reminiscent of french spanish colonial medieval style uh you would love Andorra. Absolutely That's fantastic. Fabulous. Sounds like a hidden gem to me. It's a it's a hidden gem. And maybe one in Africa. Yeah. Just to kind sure. of um, yeah. Sao Tome and Principe, oh. which is a really small island on the west coast of um, Africa. Um, you have to fly by Lisbon, uh, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, very small population. Fun fact, it is the last remaining biosphere in the world wow okay. in the world untouched um and you have just given away another hidden gem there <laughs> <laughs> no don't go on crowding there but <laughs> no but these are but it's fantastic these are yeah. really fascinating places that you spoke about now you know we've come to almost to the end yes. of the podcast um I don't know if my next question is valid because it looks like you've traveled <laughs> everywhere in the world, but I will still ask you, what is next on your bucket list? Oh, I have such a long list. <laughs> you do? Gosh, I do. Uh, Tell um, us. So I haven't been to Mongolia. Mongolia has been mm -hmm. on the list. I'm uh, desperate to go see the Victoria Falls, but both from Zimbabwe and the Zambian side, mm -hmm. just like you would see the Niagara Falls mm -hmm. from America mm -hmm. and Canada. Mm -hmm. I want to see the Victoria Falls from uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe. I would love to go to Madagascar, mm. uh, Malawi. I have tons of friends. It's just not worked out. Mozambique. M is not my favorite letter, <laughs> <laughs> but it is a long list of places. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> and I hope you get to go to all these places and explore Inshallah, more. as they say. Yeah. You, you will, I'm sure. <laughs> and please continue doing what you're doing because all your work is so very inspirational. And we need more people like you who are leading the way as far as regenerative tourism is concerned. So thank you so much for joining us this on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. I hope our conversations have fueled your wanderlust and inspired you to travel the world in new and exciting ways. Please don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and let us know what you thought of today's episode. Until the next time, safe travels and keep adventuring.